This week on The Gadget Show, I visit the biggest gadget exhibition in the world. Susie starts the ultimate knife fight, and John joins the paparazzi to find out which phone has the best camera. A few weeks ago, my gadget show bosses sent me to the States with my trusty camcorder to visit the largest gadget exhibition in the world. For one week every January, the biggest technology companies from around the globe meet up in Las Vegas. Welcome to CES, the best dang gadget show on earth. Opened this year by none other than Bill Gates, the International Consumer Electronics Show, or CES for short, is massive. Absolutely, mind-blowingly massive. There are 6,000 different stands, some of which cost millions, but all of which are stuffed with cutting-edge technology. Having got my press pass, I set about the task of searching out the show's best gadgets and found no end of people willing to help. This is the new video eyewear from Acuity. It's essentially a wearable display system that allows you to view video from just about any video source, including a PC, a laptop, uh, your DVD player, Xbox, PlayStation, you name it. This here is the new smartwatch from MSN Direct. It provides news, weather, stock, sports, all that good stuff. Tells it all right there at a glance so you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. You gotta sign up the internet. It's an FM broadcast. Buy one. So this is the AB key. It's flexible, it's ergonomic, and it's easy to learn in under an hour and more accurate than QWERTY. Okay, so this is the Motorola Ojo video phone. It lets you use your cable or DSL broadband connection and lets you make real-time video phone calls to your friends uh, who also have a video phone. Nice people, aren't they? Now it's my turn. I don't know if you can see, but I am surrounded by TVs. There are TVs everywhere of every shape and description, but I've got one just behind me, which uh, hopefully I can navigate to. That tripping over and making a fool of myself. It's the world's biggest production plasma TV. A massive 71 inches. Check this one out. Of course, for a TV this big, only a high definition picture is up to the job. And the show was packed with every conceivable size and shape and format of high definition TV. We'll be talking about high def in more detail on next week's programme. But in the meantime, you may be interested in this. Now what you're seeing here is just a normal image of a TV in two dimensions. But for me, it's a 46 inch three dimensional flat panel TV. That apple is coming right towards me. It's about here where my finger is now. Right in front of me, it's incredible. This technology is called Auto Stereo and gives you 3D with no specs. It's been around for a while, but has always been a bit clunky and fuzzy. This, though, is seriously impressive. And now for something completely different. Is it a gadget or is it art? Well, both, actually. It's an orb which changes colour based on signals it receives via a radio receiver. And this particular orb is responding to changes in the owner's stock market details. Okay, it's a kind of executive toy gone techno crazy. On the very next stand of the stock orb, I found this tiny Wi-Fi radio. It's a slightly rough looking prototype, but on this little pocket sized computer, you can listen to literally millions of internet radio stations. I reckon, as Wi-Fi hotspots start popping up everywhere, we'll see tons of these devices hitting the market. Home automation has to be one of the biggest stories here at CES, and because Microsoft don't do things by halves, to show you what your home of the future is going to look like, they've built a house. This is the sort of thing that we've seen in hundreds of sci-fi movies. But now it's a reality, and it's the type of system most of us will have running our homes in just a few years. Basically, everything that moves, works, switches on or off in the whole house is connected to this, a central server. 
It's essentially a single computer which can be controlled from various interfaces around the house, many voice activated. You can tell the lights to dim or switch off or set them to automatically come on when you enter a room. The blinds and curtains are light sensitive, closing as it gets dark. If you put your dinner in this oven before you leave for work, it'll keep it refrigerated until you text it to say you're on the way home. It'll then cook your meal ready for your arrival. The system also deals with all your entertainment needs intelligently. By playing the music, TV and movies it knows you like to a network of monitors and speakers around the house. If you'll forgive the pun, I think I'm going to be very at home in the future. Here's a gadget dilemma for you. The Swiss Army knife or the Leatherman multi-tool? Which one should you have in your pocket? Well, it's time to find out. It's time for a knife fight. One's a pocket knife with lots of other things attached like pliers and screwdrivers. The other's a folding pair of pliers with lots of other things attached like a knife and screwdrivers. They may be different, but they're also very similar. And all we want to know is which is best. So, we've devised a series of tests in which these two will go head to head. The European old master against the flashing young blade from the States. And as with all top title bouts, we'll start by looking at the form. Swiss Army knives have been made in Switzerland for over a hundred years. Designed by Karl Elsner, the original soldier's knife, with just a blade, a screwdriver, a can opener and a punch, is still given out to every recruit joining the Swiss Army. Today, at the Victorinox factory in Switzerland, 170,000 Swiss Army knives are produced every week. The steel knife blades are hardened at over a thousand degrees and every tool on every knife is hand checked before leaving the factory. You can actually buy over a hundred different types of Swiss Army knife. This one has a USB memory stick fitted. And this one, the XXLT, has an incredible 72 tools. Look, I'll show you. One. The XXLT is the largest Swiss Army knife ever made and is only meant as a collector's item. The flagship model that they actually intend you to buy and use is the Swiss Champ, with a mere 33 features, and that's the one we'll use in our tests. And because all of the tools are out, 72 is a little bit tricky to get to, but look, right in the middle, a fully functioning lighter. And lift off All astronauts on space shuttle missions have Swiss Army knives as part of their official equipment. They've been up Everest and reached both poles. For over 80 years, the Swiss Army knife was the pocket-sized multi-tool to own. But then, a young American set off to drive around Europe, and the Leatherman was born. In 1975, Tim Leatherman, his wife, and a rusty old Fiat Tipo were touring Europe in the Middle East on a tight budget. The car needed constant attention, and Tim's pocket knife wasn't up to the job. Within months, he made the first cardboard model of a new multi-tool in a hotel room in Tehran. This is the Charge, the top of the range Leatherman, and the one that we're going to use in our tests. It's got 17 tools, most of which are made of strength and steel, and this file has a diamond face, which means that it can pretty much file anything. It's hard these days to get a mobile without a camera, but the pictures they produce are usually quite disappointing. They're normally so-called VGA quality, barely a third of a megapixel, and look rather smudgy, even as snaps in the family album. But now there's a whole new raft of camera phones that claim to have raised the game. All this lot have cameras with more than a megapixel, so are they at last good enough to take some serious photos? I've been using all of them over the last fortnight, and three stand out as being particularly promising. To find out how good these three really are, I'm going on a challenging picture-taking assignment. We heard that two very important celebrities were in town, giving us the ideal opportunity to see if these camera phones can now do the same job as an expensive digital camera. 
First up is Nokia's 6630. Nokia sell more mobiles than anyone else, and this is their flagship camera phone. It has 1.3 megapixels, and with that prominent looking lens on the back, looks like it means business. After a tip, we found ourselves in hot pursuit of a celebrity spec Audi. To avoid suspicion, we decided to take a sneaky shortcut and crept up on the posh pair in a backstreet garage. Time for some scurrilous and saleable shots of them getting their hands dirty. What luck! Now, even though this is one of Nokia's top-of-the-line camera phones, it's remarkable all the things it doesn't have compared to a proper camera. No autofocus, no flash, no proper optical zoom. So it's, it's all very wide at the moment. I can zoom in a bit, but it's a digital zoom, so it degrades the picture. Still, I can uh, adjust the brightness and contrast, which is useful. And also, there's a card slot at the side, so theoretically, if I've got enough cards, I can actually take an indefinite number of shots. Hmm? Oh. Now, I'm not going to send my pictures off anywhere by picture message, because that way they get compressed, which reduces the quality. Instead, I'm going to transfer them onto a computer at their full resolution. I'm going to uh, take the card out of the camera and use the card reader on the computer. Once they're on there, I can do anything I like with them, including print them out on this battery-operated Canon printer to check the quality of my images. And the results are really quite good. Even against the light, you get decent colours, great contrast range. It's proof that these camera phones are far better than they used to be. Though when we uh, use the digital zoom, things get a bit badly degraded. You can hardly recognise those uh, famous faces. Talking of which, they're off. Sony's S700i is the camera phone I'll be using next. With a keyboard that neatly swivels away and a separate shutter release button, it really does look more like a camera than a phone. It has decent menus, a big internal memory, and it'll also take Sony's memory stick. Hmm, not exactly Cartier, is it? I wonder if our star duo aren't as minted as they used to be. I bet the tabloid picture editors would love a shot of them in here. Of course, the great thing about camera phones is they don't actually look like cameras until the point when you're about to take the shot. So you should be able to be a bit more discreet. I put my light on, see if it makes any difference. Let's see what we can get away with. Ah. It's only a phone. Honest. Well, the shutter wasn't as fast as the Nokia, and the light didn't seem that effective, but let's print it. And the results. Well, they're not quite as good as the Nokia's. They're still impressive, but the pictures are a bit grainier, a bit blotchier, even allowing for the fact that they were shot indoors. I still think, at the moment, the Nokia's still in the lead. Right, time to track down our star couple again for the final camera which is this, Sharps 902. It's the first camera phone on the market with two megapixels. It's larger than the other phones, but it does come with autofocus and an optical zoom, albeit only with a wide and close-up setting. And would you believe it? Here they are, in full view, on the pavement at the jeweler's arms. We'll take that. Having a real zoom in situations like this is jolly useful. And once you've got the autofocus locked, it's nearly as quick as the Nokia. And these are undoubtedly the best pictures out of any of the three camera phones. They're sharper, the colours are better, and even the zoomed-in shots are as sharp as the wide-angle ones. So, undoubtedly, the Sharp is the camera phone to have if you're at all serious about your photography. It's not perfect. A decent flash and even more resolution would be nice. But it's a camera in a phone that's the real thing. Which is more than can be said for some of the people we've been following about today. Now it's time to return to the heavyweight contest of the knife world. The Swiss Army knife versus the Leatherman multi-tool. Which one should you have in your pocket? It's time to find out. To conduct our tests, we've enlisted the help of the nearest human equivalents to the two knives that we could find in our gadget show office. Ian is mature, 
clever and incredibly practical, so he'll be using the Swiss Army knife. Tom is younger, quite hunky and very practical, so he'll be using the Leatherman. Ian, off the log. First up, how easy is it to get to the tool you want, especially when your hands are numbed with icy cold water? Ready, boys? Yep. yep. OK. Scissors. Come on, come on. Oh, over here. Right, ready. File. Oh, ho, ho. tin opener. In best out of three, the Swiss Army won, but that's not the whole story. The Swiss Army tools may have come out quicker, but all the Leatherman's tools locked into place and should make it easier to use, which brings us to our second test. You ready? Yep. Go. Now we want to test how good these things are at what we really use them for. Forget that Ray Mir stuff, the chances that you'll ever have to skin a yak are pretty slim. So, we've set up a sort of domestic assault course. The boys have got to put together a storage box, saw up some wood to store in it, fit a plug on the table lamp and sit back to enjoy a lovely glass of wine. But pretty quickly, Ian's having problems with the Swiss Army's lack of locking mechanism. Ow! This is really getting on my nerves. It just keeps folding in on me all the time. There's no lock. No need for you to laugh. Well, this one's solid, this Leatherman is. It's one down, Mr Ian. In fact, we all got a bit fed up with the Swiss Army. Everyone on location except the cameraman cut themselves while opening or shutting its blades. And yes, what? that did include me. Despite a desperate competitive streak that none of us knew Ian possessed, it was Tom who took a massive lead, with the Leatherman proving much, much easier to use. That was until it came to the wine bottle. Have I got time to go and chill, mine, Ian, or not? The Leatherman doesn't have a corkscrew, uh, and that was the clincher. Do you borrow mine? Again, the Swiss Army knife won the race, this time thanks to a wider range of tools. But again, we found the Leatherman easier to use. So I reckon, after all that, it's on as even. But it's not over yet. Finally, we've come to the test that we think is the most important. Which knife has the sharpest blade? If you pull a rubber band back across the blade of a knife, you'll cut it. The quicker it cuts, the sharper the knife. We tried this 10 times with each of our knives. On average, the Swiss Army knife cut the band after it had been pulled back 400 millimetres. The Leatherman's blade may look a lot more businesslike, but it actually proved to be blunter, with the rubber bands on average reaching almost 700 millimetres. Well, just as important as how sharp the knife is when you buy it in the shops is how sharp the knife stays after a lot of use. So next, Tom and Ian chopped up a whole pile of phone directories. The wood fibres that make up paper are apparently very efficient at blunting blades. Then we tested the knives again. The Swiss Army knife had lost some sharpness, but so had the Leatherman. We chopped up a few more directories and both seemed to be deteriorating at the same speed, but with the Swiss Army knife always staying that bit sharper. So which knife is the best? Well, throughout the day, we found the Leatherman charge a lot safer to use because when you use each tool, it locks into position. However, the tests do speak for themselves. It's been the Swiss Army knife that's come out on top. And when you consider that this Swiss champ costs £50 and the Leatherman charge costs £115, it's the Swiss Army knife that gets our vote. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm talking on the phone glove. The phone glove. Marvellous. I can remember you talking about it. It's actually working, is it? It, it? The Yachtscasters are computer gamers who have found fame by uploading videos to YouTube, along with comedy commentary. 